guys saw me do, talk about usability testing in the first little session. Now we're gonna talk about usability, but another interview, like, like usability testing, but another interview with participants, but in a totally different manner, because we're looking at a different type of need here. What we're doing here is we're in that design mode. We're talking about the lots of rapid prototyping, uh, mining for that kind of stuff. In the last session that we did, I said, what did I say? I said, stick to the script, stick to the script, stick to the script, right? We had a very clear, we wanted not to bias one of those kind of things. We have a lot of repeatability. We are going to turn itself on the head here. Okay, so much like that this is a mirror image or a totally juxtaposition or contrast between the perfect, the method and approaches that we're going to use. We're still going to talk to users, but we're going to talk to them, hopefully, you'll recognize in a totally different manner. Previously, I'd said things like recruit on curve, uh, recruit loosely, grade on curve type of thing. Empathy, you're probably gonna have to do a little more work in finding, you wanna find those extreme users. You wanna find really the right person to ask these questions because you're gonna mine it a lot harder. But for the access of time, because I wanna get to the hands-on aspect, we're gonna kinda jump forward to the actual interview process and let you guys figure out because your industries might be different ways to find that extreme user that you can to, to get that girl in the thumb. And we'll talk about who that user is later on too. But for now, I'm gonna jump right into this interview process. So preparing for the interview, what, what, generally what we do is we're, we brainstorm some questions. We have some rules for de-school brainstorming, which we'll kind of talk about a little later, but the idea is that we're gonna identify a focus and theme, we're gonna refine and edit the questions, and what we kind of want to do, and what I mean by refining is this one is gonna be quite different. I would say we work a lot harder with this design thinking script, at least to start with. We don't follow it to the T, but we would work harder on it because the, the effect it has or, or, or the changes, those changes have a lot greater effect on the results of the interview. So much like with the usability testing, since we stick to the script and stuff like that, is usually we get to a point of good enough. This is a point where I would say I would pay extra attention if I was creating an, an interview script for user, user interviews, okay, for design thinking. What I wouldn't do is I, I want to reword leading or biased questions. So anybody who's done a lot of the psychology work or something like that, like we don't see that we're doing it, but a lot of times we are. And so much leading questions, for example, in the usability test are bad, but they don't, they don't kill the process. You're still going to learn something like that. So if I had a leading question, like, you know, if I had something that was very, added some value or, or you know, tried to say good or bad versus something in the usability test, usually it kind of pan out. Here, we're looking, want to be as neutral as possible. We want to expand on yes or no type of questions. We don't want to answer, answer those questions that immediately give us a yes or no and kind of disrupt the flow of the interview and give us an abrupt stop because those things are harmful to the flow and I'll talk about, have a little graph about that, about the flow here. We want to make vague questions more specific. And it's not because we, we, don't, we don't like the vagueness or being open. We do like serendipity, but the other idea is like we want the thinking process to go deep. And how you go deep is you be more specific. The more specific you are, what we found is the more detailed the, the response will be. When we did the usability testing, I didn't say, does that button make you feel good? <laughs> right? Because really, I'm not really testing that because the tweak could be diff feel good means different things for different people. So the use or the tool, uh, the reason I'm doing that is different in usability testing. I want to find kind of what the minimal tweak I can get. Here, I, I want to find that one super user, the, the composite sketch that we're going to have to, to prototype with. And how I do that is I have to keep digging further. And how do I do that? I need, I need to find their empathy. Want to eliminate redundancy? This is one of, uh, you know, we said a certain uh, ethical responsibility to interviewees. This is eliminating uh, redundant questions, both maximizes your time, but doesn't waste the uh, interviewee's time. This is a case where we're going to ask a lot of open-ended questions. So the timing is even more important, it's more precious to us. So we'll go and refine that more if we have something that's duplicated. Simplify the questions, not, not, by, not, not make them less vague, but we want to simplify them, make them as short as possible because people are more likely to answer the 10 word question than they are the 50 word question. So let's take a look at some sample questions, right? Let's take a look at a cell phone case. This is the one I just kind of picked off the top of my head. I said, hey, let, 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 if I were doing some design thinking, user interviews on that type of thing, what do I do? Okay, say, you know, I would say something sort of very specific, like, what was your last cell phone case? I would not say, like, tell me about a cell phone case you had. Because they might say, sit and wait and pick one or the other. 
being specific like that tends to elicit more information because you'll say last cell phone case, they remember that particular cell phone case and they'll give you more information. Yes, you're not going to pick their favorite or that stuff, but then that might have been leading as well, right? So I'm perfectly willing to ask a question like, I, I would probably rather ask it like, you know, what was your last cell phone case as opposed to start with a question like, tell me about a cell phone case you had or what was the worst cell phone case you had? Now at the start you think, hey, that, that would be a really good question to ask me, but you're leading, right? You're, you're doing this, you're not being objective, right? So if I can't be objective that, and, and I'm worried about color, then maybe I can be specific, but I, I'll be limited. So I'll say the last one, because everybody has a last cell phone. If they, we're selecting people who use cell phone cases to have a last cell phone, right? So another one I'd say, I'll, you know, like, I won't say, is it black? Or I'll say, can you describe it, right? And that opens up, because what that allows, it allows serendipity to fall in, allows them to start giving you their story. Did you purchase it? That's a yes or no question. That wouldn't be great, but if I follow that with it, how much did you pay for it? You know, where'd you buy it? That kind of stuff, we can move on. And that turns a potentially yes or no dead end question into a not a dead end question, right? How often do you use your cell phone case? Is it always on you, right? Um, why do you keep using your cell phone case? Because these are very open-ended questions, right? You're, you're not making a survey. You're, you're, you want to elicit that level of emotion, right? Can you tell a story if you were thankful you had your cell phone case? This is a very specific question. You're going to get a very specific answer, right? You're hoping to elicit something. In some of these other ones, you'd say, you know, maybe you, you wouldn't have elicited an, if, an emotion out of, right? Like, so, yes, it's a little bit long. Like, somebody could say, well, are you leading with that thankful type of thing? I'm of the mindset of not because it just makes a threshold. I wouldn't say, what made you think that your last cell phone case was your best cell phone case? Yeah, that might be a little bit leading, but where well, you're thankful as an idea is like, you know, it provided some value to them, right? Let's take that and flip it on the, on the contrapositive. It's always easier to pick on things. So let's pick on me, for example. So if I create these questions, I'll tell you why I think they could be refined into another use, okay? What makes a successful cell phone case? You don't understand how many surveys come out with these type of things. Or they say, what would make you buy this pro make this product extreme success or something? Those are sort of loaded type of questions. Anytime you use a failure, uh, success, those type of things, they have a lot of weighting to them. And generally speaking, unless it's like a marketing survey that you're kind of getting, I probably wouldn't use that for the design thinking because probably haven't even started saying, you know, what's the definition of success and failure type of thing. I'm leaving a lot of things up to grab. I'm not, I'm not sure what I'm really getting out of the question. I like asking questions that I know what I'm getting. It's very deterministic or, or I have a good idea of what type of answer I'm getting. Not the answer itself, but the type of information. I know I'm going to ask A, I'm going to kind of get a B. I, I could ask that question and then people could tell me about like the greatest handset was a BlackBerry 10 and it was a case because it was the case for the BlackBerry 10 or you know where it's open but in the wrong type of open. A cell phone case needs to be black, right? <laughs> that, that type. Besides the leading thing, it's a dead end type of question. You ask that one, yes, or you get no, or <laughs> you, you get you're crazy or something. Well, no, well, no, but the idea is like, it's funny, like, we'll, we'll say things like this, right? All the time we do it, we throw it around, but you know, we, this is the type of level that we need to do the exact. Let's talk about cell phone case, case a friend has that you think you might like, or has secondhand information. We never want to take, like, much like the court, that kind of hearsay information. We, we never want to, to, to kind of get, to get in our position of that because it doesn't help us build our composite profile later on, which we'll talk about. Because really, you're talking about not them. You should be interviewing the friend, right? Like, I mean, at some point. And you know, we always hear these things of, I know a friend of a friend, you know, they ate this and they got whatever. Like, let's, let, I want concrete. I, I, I'm mining you. I'm mining your situation. So it shouldn't be hearsay, OK? Marketing people love these surveys that have things like this. On a scale of 1 to 10, how do you rate your current case? We don't care because we don't know what a 10 means. What, what does that mean anyways? Because it's a, if your last case was a 10, then that helps me design the next or case that's a 10 or 5. It doesn't provide me any type of value. I don't like these type of questions because I'm also not going for volume. I'm, I don't want, like, I'm not going to have 50 of these questions because if I've done my work properly, I've kind of isolated a couple of really good targets, okay? So can you draw me what an ideal case would, look, would be, right? That kind of thing too. 
it's funny because some people can't draw. That, that kind of thing is the funny part. But what I want to point out in this case is really, I don't like this type of question because we're usually interviewing the people because they're experts at them. They're not experts at design. If they were, we just hire them on our team, right? Like that, That's the wrong scenario to do something like that. What we want to do is talk about, hey, let's talk about you, how you feel as a user, not as a designer, OK? So it, it, questions like this slip in all the time. And, and, and some users are especially, how should I say, vulnerable to giving your, their opinion of how to redesign anything. You, as an interviewer, you kind of have to kind of put the brakes on politely and, and guide them to, to the, yes, you're the user here. How is your, I'm listening feedback or motion from you in your context as a consumer. Things like this, this, if you just had $40 to buy a cell phone case because you spent all the rest on apps and there's only four choices left at the store you bought, which, which fixed your phone but had various materials and didn't allow for blah, 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 it's too long. It's, it's, it, you'd be surprised how, like, it, it's a strength and white thing, right? Like, you know, you want to have, take all the words away. Steve Krug has a saying, it says, you know, take, take a page, take half the words off of it, and then take half the words off of it again. <laughs> the idea is, like, we're very verbose in our words in these days. And unfortunately, the user, by the time they get here, has already forgotten what was above this sentence and stuff like that. Yes, you have a point. OK, you, you, you want to have some criteria or something like that? Break it up to two different questions. Or maybe your question is too specific. You know, I said be more specific. But you know, are you mining the right thing? Like, Can you reword another way more simply? This is directly from the, uh, the, the bootleg, uh, basically their, their design package from Stanford, but the idea is like, if you could visually put what the curve would look like for the progress of, of, of a timeline on an interview, it would be like something here, you know, you, you and your partner, you would interview yourself, you'll say a little bit about the project. You're not too worried at this point of, of giving away the farm, but this is more like you might want to put in and say, hey, you know, right now we're just doing an interview, trying to get some information. We haven't really, you kind of want to tell them that you're not done designing. That's usability testing. You're really just eliciting some information. You want to build a rapport, and we learned about that in the usability testing. This curve here, this velocity here, is where it's really, really important. You want to start evoking the story as fast as possible, really. If you have questions and you know we're going to get them kind of going and start getting their juices of picturing of that cell phone case or something like that, ask them to begin, because you want this curve to be, because basically you don't have that much time, right? So you want this to be accelerating as fast as possible to evoke emotion early as possible, so you get to this point, right? You to explore the emotion, right? You want to get as high here as possible. And then after a time, you might have some question statements or follow up. You need to be skillful to do this. The other user ability testing, you did need to be skillful, but we can kind of help you, guide you type of way. You know, we say stick to the script. As long as one person refines the script, it can be multiplied to multi different people and sent out. I don't mean this to scare you and say, OK, don't do design thinking. But what I'm saying is that if you invest in being a good interview in this part, you will get more information at the top of this point curve. And that affects everything you do later on. So it builds up. So this one, you have to be a little more on your toes and type of stuff. Are you getting emotions? Are you doing a leading? Are you asking a leading question? Is that something the person's saying because they have baggage? Or is that something he's saying because of something else or, or that kind of thing? So it takes a little more skill. The idea is you want to get to that emotion. and sometimes. They're protecting it a little bit, not because they mean to, but that just because they aren't programmed to offer that up immediately.